Thank you for staying with us. Now, the demand for permanent seats at the United Nations Security Council has intensified as uh, the federal government has stated its long-standing commitment to national peace and security, making Nigeria a candidate for one of the seats. Each year, the United Nations General Assembly elects five new members from different geographical zones for two-year terms on the council, and Africa has three rotational seats on the 15-member council. The country's Minister of Defense, Abubakar Badaru, has said that the UN Security Council should provide fair and just representation to Africa, emphasizing its importance for conscientious global peace, inclusivity, security, deepening global peace, and building trust. The minister also noted that Nigeria has contributed to various peacekeeping missions and deployed over 200,000 troops. Joining us via Zoom from Enugu is a public relations consultant and public affairs analyst, Dr. Ambrose Igboke. Ambrose, good morning. It's good to have you join us. Good morning, Veronica. Good to have you here. But I, I think you can, if you can speak louder because I can only hear you faintly. Okay, okay. I'll try to project as much as possible so you can hear me clearly. Now, Nigeria, since the 1960s, when it became uh, a member of the UN, has contributed immensely to peacekeeping missions. For instance, Liberia. Uh, we have seen how Nigeria contributed uh, security personnel to that. And uh, right now we are saying it is time to honor our effort. Do you think that is what it is right now? Okay. I, I don't know the kind of arguments Nigeria is putting up. Uh, it is a very serious business globally to be a member of the permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, it is about, uh, it's not about just diplomacy or how nice you are. Over the years, Nigeria did not use or did not leverage on what it has done internationally. Nigeria has not leveraged on it. Nigeria fought against apartheid in the 1970s. We didn't leverage on it. What did we gain from it? I said spending billions of dollars to make sure that people like Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, got independence. We fought apartheid in South Africa. We went as far as even, you know, aligning with Eastern Bloc against the Western Bloc, which was a big deal then in, in the 70s. I remember the Moritala Mohammed uh, of Asanjo regime. We are totally pro-East, uh, and because of that, we did that. Then it, we come to the uh, 90s. Uh, the regime of uh, Ibrahim Badamas of uh made sure that we, you know, we led the team called ECOMOG, you know, the ECOWAS Monitoring Group. And we contributed. In fact, Nigeria virtually funded that, uh, uh, that uh, mission. And we have this mission in Congo. We have mission in different parts of the world. But we didn't leverage on it. Look at what we did in Liberia, for example. We did not take uh, control of uh, anything like that. We didn't even leverage or we didn't even have any political or diplomatic credit for it. We just allowed it to spend billions, it fizzled out again. And if it was a country like the United States of America that did that, you could have known what they would leverage on. Uh, 80 years after the Second World War, uh, uh, America is having control of Japan, uh, it, uh, I bet, uh, you know, remotely. But Nigeria did not even, uh, you know, take control of that. Coming back to the question, um, in the last 35 years or so, Nigeria has not done anything seriously international, apart from, you know, small, small contribution here. The last major mission Nigeria had was ECOMOC, which was under uh, uh, Buhari. After that, Nigeria has gone back. Um, a country fighting its own insurgency, a country that could not even keep out uh, external aggression in the name of insurgents and bandits and terrorists, Cannot be a member of the permanent member. Cannot be a permanent member of the UN Security Council. A member who has no uh, uh, war chest or armaments, who has no nuclear deterrents, instead of nuclear weapon deterrents, cannot even be a member of the a permanent member of Security Council. A member whose uh, economy is uh, doddering, uh, whose economy is uh, you know below par, cannot be a permanent member of the Security Council. A member whose naira, whose economy. Uh, and the uh, Naira power is not even anywhere. It cannot be. So United Nations Permanent Members of the Council are people who are strong economically, are people who are strong militarily, are people who are strong diplomatically. Uh, Nigeria is 
you said right, right, left, and center when it comes to the diplomatic stage. Uh, Nigeria's economy cannot even carry that weight. Uh, we still rely on foreign powers uh, for, for weapons, you know. Uh, so let's look at the members of the permanent members of the Security Council for the education of our uh, viewers. One, there are five permanent members of the Security Council. Mm -hmm. Three are from Europe. Uh, one is from Asia. And uh, one is from the uh, North America, which is the United States. So United States from North America. We have the Asia. We have China representing the Asians. We have uh, three countries from Europe. We have Russia. We have France. And we have the Great Britain. These are the five permanent members of the Security Council. Therefore, we are not making case for Africa. Which of which of the African countries can match the formidability of these uh, uh, five? Whereas, if uh, we want to be sincere to ourselves, and we don't want to sound uh, uh, utopian uh, patriotism here, we are going to be talking about maybe South Africa that may be even be considered for this kind of position. Uh, right. Because at least they have what it takes economically, they have what it takes diplomatically to be there. But those things are not gifted. If you watch how these members were formed, they were played integral parts in the formation of the United Nations. They played integral part uh, in the World War, uh, in the ending of the war, uh, Second World War. And that is how they found themselves there. So the framers of the Constitution or resolutions or laws that set up the United Nations were very deliberate in what did to ensure that these permanent members are the there and they have the veto. These five people have veto powers. And they're all nuclear, uh, they all have nuclear war, nuclear armaments. Right. And they have veto power. So right. that is, you cannot give that to any nation who does not deserve it. So invariably you're saying Nigeria does not deserve that position or that um, it does not have that standing as it is right now. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, I am wondering if you can perhaps give us a sense into why Nigeria at the time when it was actively involved in contributing to the various missions that had to do with the UN did not take up that opportunity to demand and negotiate for a seat uh, at uh, this table. Well, uh, one of the things we can, we can say is that um, I don't know why Nigeria did not take advantage of those, uh, those periods. I, 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 don't, I really don't know. Because um, when you watch other countries of the world go into this kind of, uh, what I call it, uh, messianic, uh, you know, ex uh, expedition where they go to other countries to want to help them in terms of their, the, what they do is, although in morality we may say it is wrong, but in international diplomacy that's what they do. They kind of ingratiate themselves in the economy of the country. They try to have control in those countries. They try to ensure that this control lasts for a very long time in those countries. And that is what usually what is what happens. Like when the uh, when the uh, uh, America went into uh, to save Europe in the Second World War by bombing uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima and ended the war. America took control of, of those things. When uh, when other countries go into such things, yeah, but Nigeria just uh, saw it as a jamboree. They saw it as a, just a, a, a military, you know, uh, I don't know, whether a military exercise for the sake of it. But by now, we are supposed to be, in fact, we are supposed to be controlling South Africa. That is why it happens in the international community. Whether remotely or whatever, we are supposed to have leverage. We are not reaping the dividends of our of uh, all the money we pumped into South Africa. The same thing with Liberia. That is why international community is wrong. It's not about uh, moral situations or whatever. Uh, international diplomacy does not run on moral situations. That is for the churches and mosques and the other religious organizations. The international community is a diplomatic jungle. And it is for those who are strong. It's for those who know how to manipulate their, their, their own positions to add that of uh, uh, power. And Nigeria has scale on that. And again, over the years, uh, Nigeria's economy has dwindled because it's not a superpower when it comes to the economy. Over the years, we found out that our industry, like when Nigeria was doing pro-East and doing all these interventions internationally, Nigeria was strong. All our refineries were working, we are producing. We had, in fact, at a point in that period, uh, in the 70s, the, the, the Naira was stronger than the dollar. So we have the prestige and we have the ability to do whatever we want to do. But that fizzled out. And now, uh, many years down the line, we are coming there. So we didn't take the advantage, maybe because we didn't know how to run this uh, international diplomacy. Yeah. Or, you know, people were in charge there, maybe we're not sufficiently trained 
uh, or they don't have sufficient knowledge on how to leverage these things. Because we would have been in charge of Africa, mm -hmm. and there would have been nothing that is being talked to about Africa that don't talk to Nigeria first. But we don't have those. So uh, now we cannot even uh, get it because we are not even qualified uh, to be there in the permanent well, member seat. We don't have what to call MAD. There's a concept in international diplomacy called MAD, mutually assured destruction. And that is what it means is that you have what it takes to kill, you have what it takes to obliterate you. We don't have that. The other members, the permanent members have that. And that is what the where is your nuclear deterrence? You don't have it. So you cannot even be there. Right. So you, you, Dr. Boke, you, you've and mentioned, I understand, I understand your standpoint, but you've mentioned a lot of reasons why Nigeria can't be a member. But then, looking at what we've done so far, 200,000 troops to 41 different U, uh, UN nations worldwide. I and, and, and I, I said you've mentioned a lot of, can you hear me now, Dr. Boke? You are very strange. I cannot hear what you're saying. Okay, I'll try to also speak on top of my voice. I hope you can hear me now, Dr. Iboke. Yes, it's very clear now. Fantastic. So you've mentioned several issues, several reasons why Nigeria can't be a member. And uh, one of the reasons, I mean, one of the things, gains that we've done, uh, we've, we've actually garnered, you know, deploying over 200,000 troops to 41 different UN missions and all of that. But you said that Nigeria cannot you know, really manage its own internal crisis. So how much more of, you know, acting on the global stage? But if you look at the countries that you mentioned, China, France, United Nations, I mean, United States, uh, United Kingdom, etc., they also have their own internal problems. For instance, China, they have their Xinjiang uh, separatism and terrorism, the conflict with uh, the Uyghur Muslim community, or uh, minority rather, the Tibet unrest, uh, cyber security threats, etc. They have their, their own domestic terrorism. Uh, talk about France, they also have their own terrorism, you know, phase from ISIS and Al-Qaeda, uh, radicalization, uh, um, yellow vest protests, cyber security threats. If you talk about Russia again, uh, you know, they also have their own issue with um, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, domestic groups, etc. Uh, United Kingdom, you know, the knife attacks and all of those things. Even in the United States, we also talk about, you know, people attacking themselves with the gun violence and also rac uh, racism, etc. You know, all of these things culminate into the, the problems that they also face. So if we are looking at, it again, uh, looking at these against that backdrop, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't that qualify Nigeria to also be a member? Because every, every country faces, you know, one or two internal as against external threats, they also face internal threats. I love your patriotism. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, actually, you, it's, it's actually based on fact. Yeah, no, when I, when you, all the things you have mentioned, basically, are domestic issues. So every country that has to do, that has human beings living, and it's human beings that are living in that, must have domestic issues. So the minority issue in, in China, Whatever you have, it, most of them are, uh, uh, you know, cells in with it. But Nigeria well, was invaded by external terrorists. And for 15 years or so, well, we have been fighting that. Well, we have not been able to succeed. Nigeria is not, on, is not in war, yet people come into the country and sack villages, burn down villages, massacre people. Nigeria is the only country not in war, that is recorded, so can check the facts, recorded so many deaths, so many casualties. So we are not even talking about the issues, about, oh, when we're here, we used to have, uh, you know, in the 90s, we used to have uh, issues of uh, ethnic militias and all those things. Those, those are internal issues. But the dynamics have changed. We have people from, uh, the, uh, from the Sahel region invading Nigeria physically. These are the issues. So, our internal security, those are domestic skirmishes that happen, knife attack and all those things. It does happen. But here we are fighting very serious, concerted aggressions from people from outside. It's a major factor. Why the second one is that the major issue is that we don't even have a nuclear deterrent. That, that is even one of the major issues because there's no balance of power. Before you become a member of the Security Council, we have people who are waiting on the line, people like uh, India. They have balance of power. They have nuclear armaments. We have people like even Pakistan have nuclear. This. We have a lot of other people that have nuclear deterrents. These are the people that can talk. These are people that can, can even say, okay, want to be members because they have what the permanent members have. But we don't have that. So one of the basic, if we think it's about nicety and drinking tea and making statements in the United States, that is not it. The main thing is the jungle part of diplomacy, which is nuclear deterrents and some other weapons. 
And that is a, like Israel has, Israel can make a case for that. So when it comes to that, because the, the, the burden of being a member is so heavy, Mm. And that imagine that every country in the world, almost the 200 members of the United Nations can do a resolution. And one country of the prominent members of the Security Council can just veto it and it won't go. These are the kind of power. Now, how much are we going to exercise power locally within ECOWAS? How much are we exercise power within Asia? When you check these countries and check their own continent, you see they have the, they have the control of their, of their continents. In the North America, and the United States has full control. When it comes to Europe, it is France and Britain. They control Europe, the, that section of Europe, Western Europe. When that you go like, to Eastern okay. Europe, you give it to Russia. So that is what we are taking. We don't have that, we don't have that command. Dr. Agboke, uh, we need to quickly put you on hold because we need to go on a commercial break. When we return, we'll continue this conversation with you. Stay with us. Information is power. Information is security. Information is knowledge. On Labor Lens, we believe that working people around the world have real questions of their own. They want to know how the world of work operates, what it means to the employer of labor, how policies affect workers in the workplace. On Labor Lens, I am sure we engage effectively the organized labor, organized private sector, and governments to get out of them information workers are in need of. I am Sharon Jackson, asking questions that make you get sense of the workplace. When you wake up in the morning, you want to start your day, start with Kellogg's, with Kellogg's. You can be your own race, stay active and alert, start your day right. Because Kellogg's is fortified with the essential vitamins and minerals you need to start your day right. With Kellogg's, you can reach your grade. The breakfast time is Kellogg's time. Thank you for staying with us. You're watching TVC Breakfast. Before we went on the break, we were speaking with uh, Dr. Ambrose Igboke on Nigeria's call for a permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council, and he has been speaking on that, on the chances of Nigeria having a permanent seat. And uh, Ambrose, you mentioned something that I want to anchor my next question on. You said that the price or what is required to be a member of even the UN and occupying such seats are quite heavy. And I am wondering if this, is, if this isn't a deliberate attempt to sideline countries like Nigeria from occupying such seats. Because like the president has said, that the United Nations is supposed to be a, a body that... Um, shows inclusivity, equality, and all of it. But uh, with the way things are going, that might be under threat. Well, the information, uh, the uh, membership of the United Nations is almost gifted. It's almost free. Once you're an independent nation, you can apply to join. Okay, so it's not a big deal. Now, the framers of the, you know, the formation of United Nations, let's even get the history. United Nations was formed in 1948. You know, immediately after the Second World War, you know, which ended in 1945. Before United Nations, there was what we call the League of Nations. That was, I think, formed in 1926. And uh, the idea was that, you know, uh, countries should come together to have a round table to talk. Because there were too much wars going on, especially in Europe. Europeans are one of the uh, most primitive people when it comes to uh, war, fighting their neighbors. No other continent as for their neighbors the way Europe does, especially in modern times. So there have always been war. I know the world wars were caused by Europe. First World War, Second World War. Second World War was very brutal. And it extended to the North America. And I, you know, it has to extend to Asia. So it became a truly a world war. So what they did was that the people who engendered the end of that war, be it United States and uh, uh, Britain, uh, then Russia also contributed. and They came together and said, okay, let us form another body that will replace the League of Nations, which is the United Nations. So let's us unite so that another world war 
does not happen. But they were very smart. Unlike what Nigeria did, where we just gifted it and so oh, let's be a big brother. They were not even trying to be big brothers or not. They ensured that there will be perpetual control of the United Nations, especially that veto thing. How can every other country in the world vote, including members of the permanent seats in the Security Council? And one of them, if one of them says no, that resolution will not go. And that is that is what they, these people framed in 1948. We are talking about almost, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, 80, 80 years ago. So they were very smart in that. And because of just control, and that is the control they have been able to, you know, hold the United Nations to. And that is why before you pass a resolution, you must lobby those those five countries. And they all must agree. And even among themselves, they lobby themselves to ensure that they agree so that one will not veto the other votes. And that is the balance of power. So uh, for a country like Nigeria, uh, when, we, when we talk about inclusivity and all those things, it's just on paper in the United Nations. It's not real anywhere. Uh, when you see, uh, okay, United Nations, Iran is sitting there, Israel is sitting there, United States is sitting there, Ukraine is there, Russia is there, and all these people that have, uh, you know, factions, there are all, all other factions there. But they come together, at least they have a place to talk. And maybe that is why World War has not happened. Maybe that is clear. But these people that have balance of power will not even see this. Now, let me take some examples. Powers, power blocks that have emerged economically. For example, the G8. The G20, and recently BRIC, that is uh, BRIC nations, that is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And then recently they became BRICS, they added South Africa. Mm. These are emerging powers where they wanted to, emerging economies, where they wanted to build a new frontier. <coughs> Nigeria is nowhere. Nigeria is not in these three arms I've mentioned. Even in Africa, Nigeria is not even respected. Nigeria is not even seen as a leader. In the recent years, South Africa has been taking the lead in Nigeria. Even small, small Rwanda is taking the lead. And we are here. Here just yesterday, the interest rate was increased. So what are we even doing as a country? If you cannot run your home to prosperity and do it well, then where is your power? When we are dependent on everything to the toothpick we import, how do we do the weapons? How do we even grow our nuclear power? So we don't have all those things. How do we manage, manage balance of, we don't have balance of trade. Ships come into Nigeria loaded and leave Nigeria virtually empty. So these are the considerations. If you don't have them, then you have no business sitting with uh, the permanent members. So what they do is that they created their permanent, they, they, get, they have other membership of the Security Council that are not permanent anyway. I think those are 50 member countries that rotate yeah. around. So that go around. So, but these permanent members, they are guided jealously. They don't want any other people to uh, any other country to come in. They maintain their power, hold, their powerful hold on the United Nations, and that is how it functions. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, there is no equity or equality or wherever in the United Nations. The powerful ones force through many resolutions, and the other members are just yes members. Nigeria is a yes member in the United Nations. That's right. We don't have, uh, and then we don't play our politics well. Look at the last vote, that resolution that took place in, in uh, I think about Gaza or something. Uh, many other countries abstain just to make sure that they control, you know, that, but we, we quickly vote, yes or no. So we lack diplomatic. That's right. Are you there? Oh. So, so. Dr. Iboke, are you there? Dr. Iboke, can you hear me? I, I would like you to talk, Dr. Iboke, so we can we'll be sure that you can hear me. All right. Uh I believe. Uh, okay. Uh, Sorry, I'm back now. Okay, okay. fantastic. So, you know, look, talking about the United Nations um, Security Council, uh, if you look at all of the countries that are there, China, France, you know, etc., and their contribution to the global peace, 
Because, you know, if you look at most of these countries, talk about United Kingdom, talk about United States, and we are having, we are having serious security issues in the country. Some of them are even, have even accused them of, you know, conspiracy theory, like creating terrorism, naming the terrorism, locating the ter terrorist, you know, in, in a place or a country where there is, you know, oil, natural resources, and then the launch attack, you know, steal them blind and all of that, and then they also restart this, you know, conspiracy theory on and on. So there have been, there have been different accusations, counter accusations, allegations, etc. We see what, um, for instance, Israel is doing in the Middle East. Now they're extending their onslaught to, you know, Lebanon, killing women and children, and see, we see the support they're getting from the United, United States. And, you know, wearing the toga of, okay, we are with you. Israel has the right to defend itself. Other countries don't have the right to defend themselves and all of that. So how do you think um, all of this, the powers that they have, that they've garnered over the years, how do you think they've used it to the benefit of mankind rather than, you know, cyber rattling, uh, cyber you know, killing people and all of that? And the UN itself, how strong has it been when it comes to saying, listen, you guys need to halt. There has to be ceasefire. And you see the like of Israel, you know, calling, you know, calling their bluff, saying nothing is going to happen. ICC invited Netanyahu. He didn't even care. He didn't even budge. So how much have they done to contribute to the global peace that we even talk about? You know the funny thing? You know, this United States just set up some arms, uh, uh, organs, like the ICC. You know that I think all of, all of them, sir, I don't think the five members of the Security Council are not members of ICC. Do you know that? <laughs> so they are not even obliged to obey the ICC. But other countries of the world quickly went to sign and join it. And they can repatriate anybody from that country to ICC. Meanwhile, the permanent members of the Security Council, most of them are not even members, if not all of them. Mm. And I think, uh, first of all, we should be clear about United Nations, it's made up of human beings. And by biological category, categorization, human beings are animals. <laughs> so, uh, and that's why higher, I higher animal, you would our, say. Our higher animal, you would say. Well, what a higher animal is there. <laughs> so, well, that is biological categorization. When we want to feel nice, we can call ourselves sophisticated or higher animals. Almost but happens. always, we have the beast in us. <laughs> and that is why we sometimes, when human beings act, we start asking, what, what's the problem? Uh, and that is why. A fella in his song titled United Nations called it Beast of No Nations. And that is very instructive. Because what has also happened is the five members of the permanent members of the Security Council are above the law. Hmm. They are above the laws of the United Nations. And that is why you see that they behave the way they do, and nothing happens. You cannot do anything to them. Can anybody do half of the thing Russia did by invading, uh, invading Kuwait? I mean, uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine. Can anybody do what America did by invading Kuwait in the, uh, in some 23 years ago uh, and invading Iraq? Can anybody do by what uh, uh, Britain did by taking over Gibraltar, attacking them? America has been consistent. They have, they have done Vietnam. They have done Panama, where they overthrow presidents and the rest. They have done Chile. They have done a Cuban missile uh, attack in 1968. America has been consistent in violating international laws. And they say you are not supposed to invade another country. They consistently do that. Mm. Has anything happened to them? Has anything happened to Israel? Has anything happened to England? Has anything happened to the perpetration of uh, financial atrocity and economic uh, uh, slavery that mm. France has been committing in Africa? Nothing. French government wanted to leave, I think, his Congo and some other country, one of the countries in Africa in the 60s, because they were asking for independence. They then blocked all the channels and all the, all the things that they constructed. They blocked the sewage, blocked everything. Mm. So when we are saying all those things, there are fanciful records for weaker countries. It's weaker countries that obey laws. Mm. What is the currency of trade in, in the world? It's not dollars. Mm. How did it come about? So when we say all those things, it, 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 it's always also... Uh, very imperative that sometimes I feel it's either because we are weak or we don't have what it takes. I don't feel that we are yes member of the United Nations. That is what Nigeria is. The people that hold the power just use all the other countries as puppets to satisfy their own. 
And that is why we should be very careful, especially when it comes to resolutions of voting and the rest. Mm. Every country, every serious country in the United Nations is not talking about world peace and all those things you are talking about. They are talking about personal interest. How mm. does it benefit their country? If it doesn't benefit their country, they don't care. They, 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 they don't bother. So Nigeria should start being selfish. Mm. We are not selfish about our country. We just go there to drink tea and make statements and read speeches. Other countries are very deliberate and selfish. They will not do anything that will not benefit them. All right. They will rather sabotage anything, even if it's beneficial to the rest of the world. It All doesn't right. benefit them. They will not approve it. And that is the way, that is the attitude we should have All right. towards international... And that's a fine place to live this conversation, Dr. Ambrose Igboke. Uh, public relations consultant and public affairs analyst. Thank you so much for your time on the program.